Well, thanks to Richard and Raywin for asking me to be involved again. So Stuart Mackay and I will uh, give a couple of back-to-back -back talks about sleep apnea, so a bit of a change of topic. Mine will be more focused on the nose and Stuart on other aspects of the um, upper airway. So it might be asked, when is the nose important in sleep and sleep disordered breathing? And it's always important to consider the nose. Um, <coughs> but you have to qualify it because the nose in and of itself really causes sleep apnea. It can certainly affect sleep quality and have an influence on it, but it's really the sole cause and that'll be demonstrated in Stuart's next talk as we get lower down in the airway. But um, why is the nose important in sleep? Certainly that during sleep, nasal air flows uh, were linked to a couple of physiological factors. And when the nose is um, occluded experimentally, there are changes in sleep, including increased apneas in physiological studies. So it's important to always consider assessment of the nose, optimize the nose, and as surgeons, we need to think about who and when to operate. So um, we've heard a lot about rhinitis, but with regards to rhinitis and, and sleep apnea, um, sleep apnea is found in a large minority of allergic rhinitis patients in the adult population. But um, you know, sleep apnea um, is associated with non-allergic rhinitis more commonly. And if non-allergic rhinitis and sleep apnea coexist, often the rhinitis <laughs> is worse and has an impact on sleep efficiency. That is the time that the patient's actually asleep um, over the time that they're in bed. There have also been studies in the last few years from Tim Smiths and other groups in the States uh, about the impact of sinusitis on sleep. And um, almost three quarters of patients with sinusitis self-report poor sleep quality on patient questionnaires. Um, and have sleep dysfunction that's associated with the severity of their sinusitis. And that in turn can relate to poor quality of life scores. So um, we need to take uh, nasal and sinus history and allergic history as demonstrated in the last talk by Pete. Inquire about whether there's past nasal surgery or trauma that may have um, affected their nasal structure. And then the relation of their nasal symptoms to the onset of their snoring and sleep disorder breathing symptoms. Have they tried any treatments, whether they're medical or device treatments um, or surgery? And it's kind of helpful to um, divide the nose up into blocks. So there's the external nose, which is evident just on a simple examination of the patient's face, but then the Next uh, step is really looking at the external floppy cartilaginous part of the nose with the nasal valves. And then for those of you who are coming up into the lab this afternoon, we'll be using endoscopes to access more posteriorly into the nasal cavities and the nasopharynx. And you can think of the nasal examination as looking at the structural parts and there might be static or dynamic factors within that, particularly at the cartilaginous nasal tip. Um, there might be inflammatory diseases such as rhinitis or sinusitis, and then that may have, have implications for sleep apnea therapy. And so our aim in the end will be to optimise the nose. So externally are there, there cosmetic concerns? Um, and is there a drooping of the tip that might have an impact on its function? The shape of the nostrils is quite individualised and, and not commonly, but sometimes patients' nostrils are very tall and narrow and their cartilages might be very floppy and that can change over time as well. And especially in trauma, but sometimes it's just the way it's developed, they can have quite a twisted nose that may need to be addressed surgically as well. So for example, you know, this fellow's got quite a twisted nose and on an examination of the nasal tip from below, it's quite apparent in that right nostril, the cartilaginous septum has been um, out of that midline skin pocket and is now resting right where the air should be. Um, so that would have a huge impact on his right um, nostril airway. So the nasal valve is this floppy external cartilaginous part of the nasal tip. Um, and 
it, it can either be a static narrowing, so it doesn't change, or it can change as the patient breathes, and that's what we um, refer to as nasal valve collapse. Um, we just saw an example of caudal septal dislocation in that patient. There can be a slightly more posterior septal deviation. Uh, there can be adhesions that are blocking off the nasal valve or less commonly tumours, but all things to examine for. And then we do a, a static um, and a dynamic examination, so get the patient to breathe in and out and look for cartilaginous collapse. And you can see the external nasal valve is lower and really is the lowest rim of the uh, cartilage in green there, and the internal nasal valve slightly higher at the junction of the upper and lower lateral cartilages. So this patient is breathing um, in and out normally, and you can see that the lateral cross of the lower lateral cartilage is quite incurved, and as he breathes in and out, it, particularly on this right side, um, it really moves in. And if he's breathing deeply, that's usually going to be more of a problem. But that can happen during sleep as well. So that was external nasal valve. Internal nasal valve, so he's breathing at normal sort of levels and then deeply. There's not much happening there at the external valve, but you can see here at the internal nasal valve, there's more of a retraction. And so a little um, instrument can be inserted at that level internally. And I'm, I'm, I'm lateralizing it there for effect, but simply just supporting it there during the examination like this. Um, and then asking the patient, does this support help improve your sensation of nasal blockage will to determine whether um, that's really a factor in them feeling blocked in the nose. Um, so more posteriorly, um, there's the nasal cavity and nasopharynx, which we're going to do in the lab. And so we'll do that uh, a bit later. How can we optimise the nasal airway for sleep apnea? There are devices that can be worn at night. Some patients even wear them during exercise. Um, but essentially, there are just different ways to spring open that nasal valve, either with strips externally, called breathe right strips that are adhesive, or internal devices such as those there. Pete's just had a nice talk about that, so I'm not going to go into that. And I'm sure there are other talks about optimization of sinusitis coming up. So who do we operate on when it comes to the nose and sleep apnea? If patients have nasal blockage due to mechanical reasons, they're more likely going to end up needing surgery. But often they'll have concomitant inflammatory disease that needs addressing with those medical treatments first. So if after medical treatment of inflammatory disease they're still blocked, then we're going to talk about surgery to them. A lot of patients will have tried some device treatment, often CPAP, um, which involves wearing a mask at night to treat their sleep apnea and that's often delivered through the nose. If they've got a blocked nose, they're less likely to be able to adhere to that. Um, there's some evidence that that's the same with wearing a, a jaw device, a, a dental splint to bring the, the jaw forward to treat their sleep apnea. Um, and it's reasonable to talk up front about surgery if um, they're so blocked that you think um, if they haven't tried device therapy that they, they might struggle with that. Um, there's good evidence that nasal surgery can have a positive influence on their ability to adhere to CPAP with a few different um, studies in this systematic review. Um, specifically after nasal surgery, the CPAP pressure requirements can drop, um, so they're less likely to feel like the CPAP's blowing their head off and therefore wear it for uh, longer. So pulling this data from an average of three to five and a half hours. And probably the threshold for patients feeling a benefit for wearing the, uh, the CPAP at night is in the four to five hour range. So um, getting it up to five and a half hours is, is probably quite useful for this group. Um, specifically, what type of surgery, septoplasty and inferior turbinate reduction, um, there's good evidence for positive um, influence of that on, on uh, sleep apnea patients and their sleep. So it'll help them sleep for longer, it'll make them sleep for a longer time of the time they're in bed. It can reduce snoring but, but rarely gets rid of it, can reduce their CPAP pressure requirements and increase their adherence and importantly improve their quality of life. Um, so I won't go into that study. Um, and there's some evidence that sinus surgery can also improve um, their um, sleep-related quality of life. 
So sleep apnea is more common in patients who have a blocked nose, so rhinitis patients. Don't forget the nasal valve when you do examination. Think about them not only having a blocked nose and how that might affect their sleep quality, but also about how it might impact on their sleep apnea treatments. It's reasonable to optimise medically first, um, but there's good evidence that nasal surgery for select patients will have a positive influence on their sleep quality and their sleep apnea treatments. Thank you. <laughs>